Hello and welcome to Enabling Urban Search and Rescue Operations with ArcGIS. Another in our series of public safety webinars provided by ESRI to promote the use of GIS by public safety agencies to support your operations and the deployment of teams to, to support use of our operations. Uh, we're joined by several esteemed guests today and proud to have personnel that have decades of experience in, in urban search and rescue. And I'd like to turn it over for introductions to Paul Doherty. Paul? Hello and welcome. My name is Paul Doherty. I started my public safety career in the U.S. National Park Service uh, as a law enforcement ranger in Yosemite National Park, uh, which is where I first got involved in GIS for search and rescue. I went on to study the topic of GIS and search and rescue for my graduate work. And since then, I've worked in the private sector and nonprofit sector in both the United States and a short time in New Zealand, where my passion is really helping public safety agencies adopt geospatial tools for decision making. Uh, New Zealand is also where I met our colleague, Jeff Monder. So I will turn it over to Jeff. Uh, yes, good afternoon. My name's Jeff Monder. I'm a USAR commander based uh, um, here in New Zealand. Um, and my, most of my involvement uh, around USAR has been uh, um, dealing with local events that take place down here as we're very lucky enough to sit on the convergence of a couple of tectonic plates. Um, a lot of my work is involved in developing and managing information management systems um, that inform and develop uh, effective coordination. Handing it over to John. Hi, my name is John Morrison. Uh, I am uh, with the Fairbanks County Fire and Rescue Department here in Virginia in the USA, right outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, I've been on the urban search and rescue team for almost 20 years, uh, where I serve as a planning section chief. Uh, and I'm also the America's region representative on the INSEROG Information Management Working Group. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mike. Thanks, Chief. I am Mike Cox. I'm your director of Fire and EMS Solutions for ESRI. And I come to you after 27 years in a county fire department in Virginia, in the United States on the East Coast, not too far from, from John there. And again, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. Proud to have this esteemed group with us presenting on USAR operations. We see USAR operations and deployments for significant events being managed through a typical incident management system and a framework or process you know, to help manage and track these activities as we respond to significant events. And GIS provides a framework for these processes. And it allows you to collect data, analyze data, make good decisions based on verified information and that incident intelligence, and then share that data where you deem appropriate to other agencies. It's important to note here that any agency that's attending today can have these capabilities and share data with NSROG type agencies or with any other agency regardless of discipline or you know what networks they're using or what devices they're using so it really does allow that incident intelligence to be shared with your stakeholders and participating or supporting agencies and gis allows you to integrate multiple data types so whether it's imagery or lidar and 3d modeling basic database like a records management system data all this kind of data can be brought together to provide that visual product to help you make decisions during a significant incident. As an example, the video you're viewing here now is from the Fire Department of New York, their Special Operations Command, an exercise involving an improvised explosive device in the subway tunnel. And you can see they were able to bring together mobile application data from, from firefighters in the field that are basically turned into human sensors, LIDAR data from a 3D modeling process, UAS data or drone imagery, all that brought together with 3D modeling and base layer mapping to provide this view of the incident to the incident commanders and task force leaders to allow them to make good decisions based on that verified data. And we see these kind of applications and capabilities applied across the spectrum of public safety operations and response. So whether we're dealing with a significant hurricane, earthquake, flooding event, definitely use our operations these mobile applications and applications to build these visual products can support you and your agency in collecting that data, analyzing, understanding what the impacts are, and make good decisions based on that data. Ultimately, we're trying to go from that map on the left to the map on the right. Now, we're still seeing hand-drawn maps in the field, obviously, but as you deal with these complex expanding incidents, we have to have the ability 
to use these dynamic mapping products to share this information to people that are that are making decisions to support your response. And Esri allows you to do that because of the footprint. 42 offices worldwide, hundreds and thousands of users. Uh, most governments already have access to this kind of capability, this kind of software. So many of the agencies online today likely have access to it and certainly can be provided based on our worldwide footprint. And because of that, that sharing capability that we spoke of that's so important, sees data move from the field, from a tactical level, like a USAR team to a command post or task force leader, all the way through to an operations center, like an emergency operations center. And we provide these capabilities through various levels of support and applications, including our solution set. So you can go to our solutions page, solutions.arcgs.com, and see solutions that you can pull off the shelf today and begin using by just adding your data and configuring it specifically for your agency. So the solutions.arcgs.com page has specific solutions for fire and rescue, emergency medical services, law enforcement, emergency management, and many others. So I encourage you to visit that solutions page and see what solutions are available to you today. Again, configurable to your needs, but off the shelf and ready to use at no additional costs. Esri also provides thousands and thousands of data sets through our Living Atlas and through ArcGIS Online. Data sets that include things like demographics and live data such as weather, traffic, and worldwide data sets that can help you respond and understand what community you're responding to, who are you serving, and who is at most need in that area of operation. And we present this data in various applications, and one of the primary is our, our dashboards. Uh, so you see Esri dashboards daily. If you've seen the Johns Hopkins COVID dashboard, that's the exact same technology we're speaking of here. In addition to that, we have other applications such as story maps that are excellent for briefings, for operational briefings, or briefing, again, those stakeholders, whether that's participating agencies, elected officials, or the media. Field operations are supported through our mobile applications. We'll see a lot of that during the presentation today. Things like our quick capture and survey one, two, three applications are widely used in USAR, uh, certainly used by the INSERAG group, which you're, you're getting ready to hear about, and FEMA urban search and rescue teams as well. And more and more, we're seeing the use of UAS and drone um, deployments to support USAR and other public safety operations. And we have applications that can support that as well. Our drone to map is a desktop based application that can support processing imagery and 3D data that you can then integrate into your GIS. And then SightScan is a cloud-based program that allows not only for imagery processing, but flight planning and fleet management. So please take a moment to take a look at those applications that can support your UAS or drone operations. And finally, I wanted to bring to your attention our disaster response program. It's been in service for about three decades now and provides you direct support if you have an approaching incident or you're dealing with a significant incident and can provide software, technical support, uh, and actually can provide boots on the ground if necessary to support you. Emergency operations center setting or any significant event that you might be facing. So you can go to our disaster response webpage and there's a simple button there that says request assistance, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you get a response to, to provide your support for whatever the incident is you may be dealing with. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Paul, and he can begin describing his experience with USAR operations and the INSERAUG program. Paul? All right. Thanks a lot, Mike. So first, I want to start with the real-world problem to give a little context for those of you that aren't familiar with urban search and rescue, or as I might slip and say, USAR. Uh, urban search and rescue is a type of technical rescue operation that involves the location, extrication, and initial medical stabilization of victims trapped in an urban area. They're configured into teams, and we typically call these task forces. Task forces are comprised in, uh, in the United States of first responders from fire, law enforcement, and some civilian specialists like doctors and structural engineers. These men and women typically have little or no GIS experience, but they generally love maps, and that's why I love to work with them. In the United States, there are a total of 28 Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, task forces. In addition, there are many, many state, local, uh, state, local tribal, and territorial teams, 
and some of which of these are members of our state urban search and rescue alliance or we call SUSAR. USAR is considered a multi-hazard discipline as many of you know and it may be needed for a variety of hazards including earthquakes which you'll hear a lot about uh, with our INSERAG colleagues but also cyclones, storms, tornadoes, floods, you name it. They also end up playing a critical role in initial damage assessment, which is what this photo here shows. And that is really important for emergency uh, management in both the response phase and the recovery. Uh, they're often the first boats or boots on the ground. So I'd like to start with uh, a little story. Basically, until 2018, most of the task forces relied heavily on paper maps and forms with some advanced teams using GPS via a protocol we called Ironsights. Through this process, the USAR community adopted 24 standard icons or waypoints. They adopted the use of track logs for search documentation, and they had some area types called search segments and operational areas. These were good standards or best practices to start from, but this approach simply wasn't scaling to the complexity of a modern disaster. So here's an example of a data dictionary for types of searches. You may use this in the, the country where you live, but we start with uh, a rapid uh, search, which is a fast paced and methodical search of an area. We might uh, rescue some uh, victims, but we won't spend a lot of time in any particular structure. Uh, all the way out to uh, a secondary search where we're doing a systematic search of every room of every structure in the assigned area. And so we need to be able to adapt to these different types of searches based on the mission. So the technical problem that we faced uh, was that using paper, pen, and GPS um, really wasn't scaling. It wasn't simple. Uh, there was a lot of complex processes and it wasn't real time. Uh, as far as situational awareness goes, it was difficult to ascertain tactical awareness down at that uh, particular structure level, all the way out to strategic, where we're looking at a wide area for many teams. It also lacked the ability for us to map out areas and generate any types of search analytics to answer key questions like how many buildings are impacted based on models and how many remain to be searched. And then finally, um, a, a term that's used a lot in our country is a COP, a common operating picture or platform. With the old approach, we had so many KML files and spreadsheets and limited interagency coordination, and it was nearly impossible to create this common operating picture or platform. So for increasingly complex disasters like Hurricane Harvey a number of years ago, the, the technology was not meeting the need, and there was really limited uh, geospatial coordination. So it's a big, multifaceted challenge involving people, process, and technology. And by the way, uh, we don't have nearly the same amount of funding as other areas of public safety like uh, wildland fire. So this was a daunting task, but we accepted the challenge as a team of uh, a community around search and rescue. A fellowship was born and starting uh, with Hurricane Harvey and Irma in 2017, we formed a working group across uh, several different agencies, uh, National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation, or NAPSIG, that SUSAR alliance that we talked about earlier, the International Association of Fire Chiefs, and the FEMA uh, Urban Search and Rescue System. We uh, joined forces to tackle some of these technical problems and also some of the coordination problems. In uh, 2020, Hurricane Laura, we collected over 60,000 waypoints uh, from both these federal or FEMA teams and the state urban search and rescue teams. And we were able to create a common operating picture. And here's just an aggregated view of uh, the data that was collected, mostly around initial damage assessment. The technical solution to this real world problem and technical problem involves uh, starting with a foundational data model. We needed to adopt the, uh, the symbols and the terminology they were using already but then make sure we have an agile development approach to refining the tools. So as we had said, you know, you get the technology and then it has to be configured. Well, what we've done is created a solution so that uh, each search and rescue team don't need, doesn't need to develop this. For those of you that are familiar with ArcGIS, we're using a number of different apps um, to do this. We use ArcGIS Online primarily. We have a landing page where we use Experience Builder, we are uh, using different combinations of field apps with quick capture being the most simple. 
we use Web App Builder for data editing and we use uh, dashboards for different views of the data. But as you'll see in a moment, we keep it really simple. We send them all to one website for all this information. And uh, I think this is probably best demonstrated with a short video. I will try to uh, speak a little bit slower than usual um, because I know not everybody here is a native English speaker. So apologize if the timing is a little bit off. All right, so this year our focus is really on simplifying everything. As I said before, there's this ArcGIS Experience Builder page, and it's there to facilitate access to everything from training materials to field applications, web applications, and dashboards. This, what I'm showing you here, this red page is our sandbox where we do testing and training, um, and it's accessible to the whole community for that purpose. Depending on your role, you might be guided to different applications. For example, this battle card page takes you for uh, apps for field users. This plans page takes you to apps that are for a planning team. And then the incident support team uh, can get directed to other links specific uh, to them. As we move over uh, in a moment here to the, uh, the bottom of the page, those are our training resources. And then on the, uh, the next page, the battle card, as we call it, this is just a way to get teams in the field quickly. So for those conducting operations in the field, they go to this tab. This year, our primary application is Quick Capture. It's an easy to use app that inexperienced SAR personnel can up, get up and running with in just a few minutes. For USAR, Quick Capture is used to create track logs as well as drop waypoint during our recon and hasty rapid searches. As I'll show you in just a minute, we're also using it to link out to other apps like Survey123 and field maps for situational awareness. I'd like to note that we have a series of newly created training videos linked here at the bottom that go into more detail on how to use all of these applications. So to get started, you would just scan a QR code. Uh, all you have to do is scan that and this will open up uh, the installation page or if you already have the app, it will take you right to the exact project we're using for data collection. So uh, this reduces the need to search around. The first thing you have to input is your team name, and we keep this really simple. We use the naming conventions that the teams use, and um, this just gets them started and lets us know what team they belong to as soon as they uh, start the project. Now, the next thing you'll notice is the quick reference and data dictionary buttons. Uh, this allows us to send people to the documentation. We do training, we provide videos, but it's nice to have a simple to read um, training documentation in the field. So as with a traditional GPS, you start your tracks at the beginning of an operation and you stop it once you're done. Here I'll start with just a hasty or rapid search. You can see that is recording your tracks because the button is flashing and there's a small red circle indicator. So very simple to train uh, our teams on. Each waypoint category described earlier is split up into sections with uh, the damage assessment being a really commonly used uh, waypoint type and we even link out to documentation there. Some of the uh, different waypoints have the ability to add a photo if it's something that's commonly requested. And I'll just show you a few different uh, waypoints here in the demonstration. So in this case, I'm just adding some damage comments to, uh, to a waypoint. In this case, we're showing uh, the number of people that uh, we've just recorded a waypoint for. And then finally, we can add some comments to different uh, waypoints. So finally, uh, it's really important, this app will use your GPS by default, but sometimes you're observing a structure and you need to use, you need to move the location so that it matches the observation in the field and this is just a really simple way to, to do that. So it goes beyond just using your own GPS location. Finally, you have the ability to link out to other companion applications. We sometimes use Survey123 or uh, Field Maps. If I click this button, it's going to download the exact form they need for the incident. And I'm able to uh, use Survey123 to add more detailed information when it's required. Uh, so Survey123 is a great, great app for doing that.
one of the things we learned from our insert colleagues is every waypoint should be able to be categorized as complete, assigned, or needs follow-up. And so that's something we added this year. So now I'll show you how the data collected in the field can be viewed in the base of operations. And here we have our tactical dashboard. This dashboard is primarily used to monitor the search progression and prioritize potential issues by using that same follow-up status. The primary audience is the planning and operations staff that are supporting field teams at a tactical level. You'll notice on the left is a running list of waypoints with the latest points at the top, so you can see where teams have recently been active. Waypoints highlighted in red are the ones that need a follow-up action, and you can filter the list to view only those waypoints that need follow-up by clicking uh, needs follow-up here, uh, which is a filter. Additional filtering of waypoints can be accomplished by opening our slider panel, and you can filter by date, team, and squad, which are common questions. Similar to waypoints, there's a track log list, and you can ask teams to stop and submit the tracks at the end of each search segment so you can verify they're searching the correct areas and did not miss any structures that might be hard to find in the field. You can also filter the dashboards by incident, uh, which we are doing right now during our exercise. We have about 18 simultaneous exercises going on at one time. And uh, here's just a sample incident um, based on the 2020 Seneca tornado. After we choose this particular incident, you can click on the search segments within that incident. To dig a little deeper, you can click on one of these segments to see what its status is, but as well, we can also see the number of uh, buildings in that area. And that allows us uh, to kind of track status, how many waypoints have we collected versus the number of buildings. This, es this estimate can also be used to estimate the number of uh, human hours that's required to complete the segment. So it's some uh, analytics that can be derived from the segment. So now you have a quick preview into the, how the, the whole uh, solution fits together. Um, this was based off of after action reviews and um, multiple different incidents and trainings. So um, what's really important is we developed a technical solution, but we really needed to develop a people first solution. Uh, much like other coordinating bodies in the United States, like our National Wildfire Coordination Group, we needed to formally engage agencies and encourage them to adopt this standardized approach. We're working together to support a national SAR geospatial coordination group, and this group also plans to engage directly with the International Search and Rescue Advisory Group, or INSERAG. Next, we wanna make sure that FEMA's 28 task forces are fully interoperable with state and local teams. And for this, we're using ArcGIS Hub and partnered collaboration to help centralize or federate field data collection for large scale disasters. Uh, this is modeled off of how the wildland fire community works. For those agencies that feel that they must host their own platform, we also intend to create a solution kit. Uh, so for those of you outside the United States, uh, this should be a good opportunity to get a jump start in setting something similar up uh, so you don't have to start from scratch. And then finally, there's a constant demand to simplify the experience for the field users. Um, so we're always testing new technology like Jupyter Notebooks for pre-populating ICS forms or incident command structure forms. And we're prototyping workflows for integrating with other messaging platforms like Microsoft Teams and Telegram and others. We are testing uh, ArcGIS has a tracker for real-time last known position of Teams. And we're also investigating ArcGIS velocity for integration. We are working really hard behind the scenes to make it simple for the firefighters, and that involves scooping out a lot, a lot of different technology. Uh, we currently have an exercise, and like I said, there's over 18 uh, different field exercises going on concurrently, um, and we're using this as an opportunity to prepare for hurricane season. Uh, I'm sure many of you can relate. COVID-19 really drew down a lot of resources and prevented in-person trainings. But with this system, we can participate in exercises remotely, which is a real game changer for the community. All right, and I'll wrap up here. More importantly, uh, what's next for you? If you wanna get involved or test out some of the apps, you can see the sandbox and training videos, uh, which are linked in the slides. And just remember that that sandbox is for training only, not for responses. Uh, we need to set up your own deployment solution uh, for actual deployments. And then what's really important is uh, the resources on this particular page, the SAR GIS page, 
Uh, there are resources on this page, not just for urban search and rescue, which we talked about today, but also missing person search operations and more traditional wildland technical rescue, which we didn't get into today, but these are great resources to have. And then finally, if you're based in North America, you can sign up for our uh, search and rescue GIS interest list. Uh, this is a group that meets uh, monthly, um, once a month on a hangout call, and uh, we share tech updates there, and it's been really helpful. But ultimately, it's up to you and your agency to train and exercise. Even better if you can integrate some of these tools into your daily operations, uh, because like we say, train like you fight and fight like you train. So with that, I'm pleased that you'll hear from our partners from INSERAG, uh, International Search and Rescue Advisory Group, who use really similar technology adapted for their workflows. So over to you, Jeff. Good evening or afternoon, folks. Um, my name's Jeff Maunder. I'm a USAR commander for Foreign Emergency and also the co-chair of the INSERAG um, Information Management Working Group, along with John Morrison. Uh, we're both part of the team that designed and developed um, what we call ICMS or the INSERAI um, Coordination and Management System. So John, if you just want to introduce yourself again. Yep, my name is John Morrison again from Fairfax County, Virginia in the United States. Uh, and I am the America's Region Representative on the INSERAI Information Management Working Group. Jeff? Roger that. So we, we use lots of acronyms in uh, all of our day-to-day -day work and especially in the UN. So INSERAG is, an internet, is the um, International Search and Rescue Advisory Group, um, which is a global network of some 90 countries and 60 USAR teams. Um, the whole pur the purpose of INSERAG is to develop and um, articulate s uh, standards for international urban search and rescue um, especially around coordination and the methodologies that we use for uh, earthquake responses uh, historically, but INSERAG itself is moving into a much more flexible response model as, as we go along. I guess the why for INSERAG is because uh, coordination saves lives and within the ICMS contact for the Information Management Working Group, it's about um, more effective coordination is likely to save more lives. INSERAG in its own way um, provides an opportunity in the structure that allows us to develop um, and deliver uh, an, uh, enhancing capabilities of which our ICMS is but one. So the history um, for, for us, um, and, and it's quite important that the history is recognised because it's, it's the, the system itself is a combination of, of history. So pre-2020, uh, as Paul talked about, um, paper-based systems were all there was, very difficult to share, um, and lots of duplication of effort. Um, really good examples for us, we're in New Zealand with the Christchurch earthquake where often we had buildings being assessed Five to, five to six times because information was lost. 2010 saw the introduction of a standardised form set, um, which then allowed um, you know, a common, common data set to be created. 2015, uh, a project was created around the, using an open source capability called Kobo, which was the beginning of our digitisation of data collection. 2017, a momentous occasion, the INSERAG Information Management Working Group was established, which brought together a, a range of interest, interested parties and countries um, for uh, the development of, of this type of capability. And in 2020, our ArcGIS for Collection Analysis and Reporting System was deployed into the INSERAG environment. So if we, um, if we if part of that history was a project that was based on a, a Kobo toolbox. One of the challenges for us around um, Kobo toolbox that was there was open source and it ended up being quite limited for us, but it did a number of very important uh, precursors for the development ICMS, which is in that it introduced um, mobility solutions and kind of indicated what was possible. Uh, our colleague Peter Wolf from Germany spent a couple of years trying to, to make it work, but ultimately it wasn't really suited to the long-term needs of a very complex sudden onset disaster type emergency and the requirements for us are what we wanted from that piece of capability or the piece of software, it was never going to be able to do that. And it provided a limited um, introduction to the concept of digital data collection and it did enhance that, but it was a double-edged sword in that COBA was never going to be able to make the needs of INSERAG. 
and the longer we pushed it, the more pushback we received. And you have to be very careful when you're utilizing systems and, and you stick with systems that are not going to actually meet the long-term need that you end up creating a resistance to any any solution. Um, you know, because we tried to make the process fit the technology rather than design a technology to fit the process, it was always going to be flawed. Um, AGOL provides a sound cots based system for developing ICMS and we've been quite successful. So if we go back to where, where the ESRI component came into um, the USAR environment, was through the, through the um, Information Management Working Group, we had a, a number of options available to us. Here in New Zealand, we obviously have a, a number of um, natural disasters, especially earthquakes, given our um, locations sitting on two volcanic islands, somewhere in the South Pacific on the convergence of two tectonic plates. Um, so there's a number of earthquakes. One of them was Christchurch, one of them was Kaikoura, where my involvement, um, we didn't have any ability to collect information effectively. As I said before, in Christchurch, you were having multiple multiple surveys of the same buildings, duplication of effort, and, and no real common operating picture was established. So we, we did a whole lot of work, which created a, a number of solutions, which um, when we brought that together, into the information management working group and we extended the, the ability or the, the view of the worldwide village that we have and, and, and our Instrug family, we had a significant um, uptake and we pushed to have ICMS um, as, as the development platform for what we were going to be ultimately presenting and delivering in 2020. ICMS is um, it's a it creates a, a unique instance for every event that it goes to, um, and all the USAR teams not only have um, a sandbox or a training session of their own to play in, but as I said, whenever there is a, a specific disaster, the whole whole set of forms, applications, and dashboards are all created for each one. So the information management working group. What it was, it was formed to help and deploy an information management concept. It's important that we understand that the, the mandate for information management working group is not just ICMS, it's a whole range of things that um, will take the ability to manage information and intelligence systems in any type of sudden onset disaster um, so that we in increase the capability of coordination and provide decision makers at any, all levels with a, a great set of information to make decisions on. Um, it was formed to help deploy the, the IM concept. It's a whole group of international urban search and rescue or USAR people, which, um, and these people have a range of skills, not only um, in the, the operational area, but also as, as, as John, I'm sure won't be too offended if in the geek section of our, of our capability. And the really good thing about this is that the people have an understanding of, um, both sides, so it's not it's not just two groups of people. Our role was to move from Kobo to to Esri based system. Um, we had about a year to do this, so from 2018 2019 we we developed ICMS. I ran it through a number of iterations and testing in Europe, and through a QA and test program, ready for operational use in 2020. And it was deployed to that environment in in, in 2020 and in um, August of 2021, it was deployed operationally into the, into Beirut. So that's me. Uh, over to you, John. Thanks, Jeff. ICMS is built with a range of products within the ArcGIS platform, including app-based data collection, operations dashboards, web maps, web mapping applications, ArcGIS Hub, all scripted from master templates through a Jupyter Notebook. The Jupyter Notebook provides the ability to keep a master copy of all the elements of ICMS and build a new standalone version specific for each disaster response. The multiple step notebook copies the master template elements and then remaps those new elements to reference each other, ensuring that no cross contamination of data can occur. As Jeff said, Using Survey123 and Explorer for ArcGIS, ICMS allows for online and offline data collection. 
after an earthquake, land-based mobile networks are either offline or swamped with usage. Survey 123's offline option allows critical data collection to continue and records can be synced once a mobile or satellite network is reached. Explorer allows responders to access maps showing work sites and provides links to create follow-on reports in Survey 123 where common information between record types can be pre-populated, removing duplicative data entry. And one of the keys to success in this entire process is that we weren't introducing both electronic data collection and new sets of data at the same time. All of our practitioners were very familiar with the standardized set of data that we call forms that we started collecting in 2010. And so transitioning to a digital data collection process from the paper-based process was just a natural evolution as a step forward. Our dashboard mirrors the timeline of an incident and phases. When an earthquake happens, search and rescue teams from around the world fill out their team fact sheet, which details capabilities and arrival information. Once they arrive, the recon phase begins and worksite triage forms are submitted so that rescue work can be prioritized to do the most good for the most people. After worksites are identified, Teams are tasked in the operations phase to perform the rescue work and report on the victims that have been rescued. As I said, our dashboard mirrors that. The ICMS operations dashboard is tabbed to ensure correct information is presented to the user based on their current needs. This overview allows for emergency managers to visualize the current progress across the entire disaster response. We have broken the logical areas out into worksite metrics, victim metrics, worksite assignment, and completion metrics, as well as a team summary. The team summary is broken out into a page listing the teams themselves, their capabilities, Expected arrival timeline, which is crucial to help with airport logistics and customs and immigration officials. A map of teams and their base of operations, as well as the team's demobilization information so they can leave the country, allowing them to return home and other rescue and recovery workers to enter. During the triage phase, the rapid collection of accurate data is incredibly important. Our triage dashboard is broken out into worksite metrics, information on trap survivors found during triage broken out by the sectors within the city, counts of different buildings by sector, and then a list and maps showing worksite locations. Within the operations phase, our dashboard is broken out into worksite metric report metrics, mappings of site and their status, and detailed victim information. The logistics tab is broken out into items requested, requests being processed, and completed requests. The photo gallery allows photos taken with Survey123 to be visualized by any team within the system. This is an important factor in rescue preparation. As the old adage goes, a picture is worth a thousand words. Many times, the team that performed the triage of the building is not the team performing the rescue. So a photo of a work site allows the rescuing team to prepare the appropriate tools and equipment prior to leaving their base of operations. Custom web mapping applications provide teams the ability to sectorize city into smaller areas and allows search and rescue teams to review and approve field submitted reports prior to visualization on a dashboard. One of the most important findings through our development cycles was that decisions were being made by incident coordinators based on invalid information. As Mike said, we wanna make good decisions faster 
but we don't want to make bad decisions faster. By adding a team approval flag to our Survey 123 forms, we ensured that quality control was in place before records appeared on the dashboard for action. A small counter shows the number of records awaiting quality assurance review and highlighted those waiting more than three hours to ensure they were not overlooked. Tests and trials and feedback are critical to the success of our system. Success is by no means a straight line from concept to execution to completion, and the development of ICMS is no different. We piloted this site through numerous tabletop and field exercises, including a very cold one in Denmark that you can see here, to ensure what we provided is what's needed for all of our stakeholders. Requests for change and feedback were brought back to the information management working group, estimated for effort, and then prioritized for development. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff to talk about how ICMS was operationalized. Right, so after all of the work that was done over the, that period of time, but it was from New Zealand to Inserag deployment in just over a year, and the trial and effort that went through um, by everybody basically de de delivered a, a, a system that we're very, very proud of. It was tested within all our different working groups, but it's the full scale exercise, which was about minus 10, which for those of us that don't live in that type of environment was was, was interesting. Um, and as a result of, of the feedback from Tinglev and, and the Netherlands who provided, who, who were brave enough to be our guinea pigs for the testing for their reclassification, we presented the outcomes and proposals to the team leaders meeting in Santiago in 2019. Um, deployed, deployed into the environment around about March, um, virtual training um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we, we had to be a bit creative and we developed a whole range of virtual training sessions for, for everybody. And then along came the port explosion in Beirut of August 2020, of which ICMS was delivered for its first time into an environment that, it, to be fair, it wasn't actually designed for. It was it was an earthquake response um, system, um, but we we're very pleased that it adapted really, really nicely. So what's key um, was that um, we, we've been a little bit of a, the victim of our own success, especially from uh, from Beirut, where a, sig a significant amount of feedback that's come back to us is around about how we can collaborate across the different UN agencies. And, and in the case of an, an earthquake or instrag responses, how do we how do we share this information um, with other people um, who are not using the same system? So Paul and I are working on that, how we how we link the US and instrag systems together um, should should that event occur. One of the key things around Beirut was was the potential for collaboration and how that will fully realise the potential of, of these type of systems. So ICMS is only a single um, example of, of a end-to-end -end system that uh, are adaptable, uh, collaborative and focused on the outputs, you know, delivering key intelligence to the right people at the right place at the right time to ensure that the decision making of coordination and coordination efforts are the best it can be in environments which are which are very typically short on good information. So where to next is a good question. Um, many of the outcomes from the the Beirut ex, uh, explosion showed us that um, collaboration is a key is a key focus across um, the different agencies that sit within the UN. Um, UAS or, or drone outputs provide significant enhancements to situational awareness and is a growing piece of technology that, that we are very keen to um, put into ICMS, both in mapping as well as, as you've seen examples before, um, utilising 3D imagery that gives teams and coordinating coordinators a really good understanding of where people are going. Um, ICMS is focused on our higher level coordination efforts um, with UCC or USAR coordination cell. Our next stages will see a, a more granular approach to mod and module that provides the, the teams with a coordination monitoring and tasking tool, um, potentially within tracker and workforce. And then how do we collect the additional inf information and additional um, that we can share across agencies and platforms without overburdening our USAR teams as they work on their primary missions? Um, 
and as I said before, one of our key key challenges will be is how do we link INSRAG um, based intelligence um, into local intelligence sections. So that that's about it. Us that's about it from us. I do apologise if the my, my my terminology may be, have been a little bit different, but um, if I just hand it back to, to Mike now, um, and thank you very much. Thank you, Commander, and thanks to the entire panel for that very comprehensive presentation on an on a excellent solution to a, a significant problem, obviously. Um, so we've got a few questions, and I want to, to remind the audience that if you have any questions, there's a chat function in the GoToWebinar panel. So please enter your questions there, and if we don't get to them today, we'll certainly respond by email or um, connect with you after the webinar. And you'll also be receiving a email, including a link to the recording and links to some of the resources we discussed today. So you'll have access to that information as well. Um, so first question, I'm gonna go back to you, Jeff. You know, you mentioned, and I thought it was very eloquently put, you mentioned, you know, trying to, to change a process to fit a technology versus adopting the technology to the process. Were there any other or significant issues or obstacles you faced, particularly with you know, the wide range of, of countries and regions you're implementing the solution? Were there any other obstacles you ran into or, or, or gotchas maybe you can tell the audience to be prepared for? I think most of the challenges really are in the in, in incipient stages. Often people will, will not understand what you're talking about. Um, in, in the case of Inserag, you know, we were very fortunate in the fact that we had a robust system that was already in place. One of, one of the biggest challenges that you'll face is if you try to do uh, too much in that introducing new process as well as a new, new system. Uh, for us, um, it wasn't as difficult as we imagined it would be, um, but that's primarily, we think, down to, to the fact that this, we were basically digitizing a known, a known system. Um, but it's really important that you have uh, an understanding and support from from your parent organization, whatever that might be. Excellent. Thanks so much. So obviously we're deploying you know these kind of technologies and, and with these kind of resources into some relatively austere environments. So Paul, can you dive a little bit deeper? I know John mentioned it, but could you dive a little bit deeper on how do you address operating in areas without connectivity? Great, so uh, the first thing is all of the mobile applications, which are our way of, of collecting the Intel, they all work offline and we provide offline uh, base maps wherever possible. And then for most teams, uh, when they reconnect to the internet, either through a satellite connection or back at the base of operations, they can quickly push all the data up at one time versus uh, trying to, pull together GPS cables and all sorts of other things until late into the evening. And so that's gone a really long way for us. Um, as connectivity improves in disasters, I think we'll see more and more real-time work, but we're able to transition from a connected environment to a disconnected environment uh, quite well. Uh, much like Jeff in New Zealand and Interag, we try not to actually build too many containers or silos for our work because what happens is when we do get internet and we are trying to collaborate across a wide area, if we build our own system that only works offline, then we can't really seamlessly uh, collaborate when we need to the most. So um, so I think the key thing is the field apps work offline and we always uh, are able to get a connection for them to quickly push all the data up where everybody can see it. Great, great explanation. Thanks, Paul. And I, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll back that up a little bit with you know, my experience in urban search and rescue is in the in the disconnected environment, you know, by, by policy or practice, you know, most of the time when that task force leader or command post gets the data, it's hours old, where now we have the ability to get data to them in seconds, if not minutes. Um, so yeah, excellent workflow and, and excellent solution there. Um, so Paul, and back to you, because I think this is specific to the, to the Sandbox and the NAPSIG program. Uh, could somebody internationally access the Sandbox and the Wide Area Search Quick Capture app for training and be able to do that outside of the outside of North America or outside of the United States? Absolutely. The, uh, the Sandbox environment is there for you to test. Um, we ask that you do not use it for real world operations and, um, of course, use it appropriately. But it's there for you to kind of get your head around how all of this works before you invest the time in setting it up yourself. 
we have a documentation page for GIS specialists to kind of walk through each step but we're working closely with Esri and the Napsig Foundation to make it easier for you to deploy these apps into your ArcGIS environment. So stay tuned for that. Excellent. Uh, John, I'll come back to you, Chief. Um, so in order to use the Jupyter Notebook feature, do you need to have some kind of coding ability? Yeah, it's, uh, it's written in Python, but it's actually very straightforward to use. And there are some great examples, both on ArcGIS.com as well as other places on the internet that you can find uh, how to build a, a, a notebook. And, and typically what we, you do is you start very small and you try to do one thing. And the great thing about Jupyter Notebooks is it allows you to do step-by-step -step, uh, processes. So if one step has an issue, it won't proceed to the next step unless you build it that way. So it's really easy to modularize the, the Jupyter Notebook, uh, which allows for very quick reading and then also very quick uh, debugging while you're building it. Excellent. Next question, uh, it could be John or, or Jeff. Do you have a training or, or practice platform like we discussed the Sandbox for the ICMS or how do you train the NSROG teams or the, or the, the responders using your, your application? Yeah, I can take that one, Jeff, if you're good. As good as. <laughs> good. Uh, yeah, so so what we one of the things that we felt very important about was that each team had the ability to, to play in their own environment as frequently as they want to. And so using that Jupyter Notebook, we basically built every urban search and rescue team in the world that is NSROG classified, and there are about 50 to 60 of them. Uh, their own sort of playground uh, where they can go in and they can enter data and they can put whatever they want in there and no other team will see it. Uh, and so it's very important that that data is kept um, to themselves uh, separate from a potential working incident. And then when we have things like regional exercises or um, big trainings, what we'll do is we'll build a whole another set of forms, an, a new ICMS version for that particular earthquake response exercise, for example, and all the teams with accounts can then log in and go for that particular event. And then when a new disaster comes, we'll build another one and, and the teams can log in for that event. Um, so it's very key to keep all that data separate uh, because in case we have two disasters happening at one time, uh, it's easy to keep that apart so you can actually make decisions on the right data. I think Excellent. it is important to note that those that the access to those are only at this time for classified uh, NSRAG teams. And Jeff, that was going to be the, the next question. So obviously, you know, supporting NSRAG teams, do you find yourself, you know, either assisting or providing information to non-NSRAG agencies? Obviously, any agency could deploy the same technology, but is there any coordination from NSRAG and, and, and with agencies that not, might not be designated as an NSRAG team? Yes, yeah, so at the moment we have a, a program that's in, in the process of being deployed, uh, which is around national teams. Um, so at this stage, what we are doing is we're we're getting the emergency response section of of UN OCHA to to start identifying the initial national teams that we were go we are going to support. Um, and they at the moment they will primarily have a, an Insurag team as a mentor, and then those teams will be will get access to the system. Um, and so that, that builds not only capability, but it also improves the outcomes as local teams um, are aligned to the NSRAG methodology, mean that together our coordination is much more effective. So that's definitely something that's, that's, that's in the process of being rolled out, but it's in the very early stages. Excellent, excellent. And, and Paul, could you maybe expand, I know you mentioned it briefly, Expand on the on the initiative to coordinate between you know local, regional, and, and national level assets on data collection during significant events. Yeah, one of the reasons that uh, we find it really important that the we coordinate from local all the way up to federal is that the disasters are growing increasingly complex, and if we're able to share our observations in the field. Um, I think uh, Jeff or John presented a great example of just showing the photos of the damage. Uh, that reduces the duplication of effort as we move from response to recovery. Um, so it helps in response to make sure we don't double cover areas uh, between the different agencies because 
I don't know about your country, but sometimes agencies don't do a great job of communicating, but the maps will communicate for you and tell you where people have already been. But all the way out, not just from search and rescue, but into the later phases, uh, where in the United States, in order to get reimbursed for the, the damage, um, you have to show evidence of the damage. And since search and rescue are often the first boots on the ground, um, these, these photos and the other information really uh, can jumpstart the process to get people back in their homes if their, host, their home is standing or to begin the recovery process if they need to uh, move on to another area because they've lost their home. So really important that we collaborate across all the different agencies and maps are great at doing that. Excellent point. Thanks, Paul. And I want to again extend, uh, extend my thanks to Paul, John, and Jeff for the excellent presentation. Um, you will be receiving um, an email with the links like you see on the screen now, these resources, uh, along with a link to the record, recording of the webinar, which you can then share with those that maybe didn't make it today that need to see this webinar. That's how important it is. Um, also, please put on your calendar, we have an additional webinar on June 9th um, aimed at incident management, incident management teams, and disaster preparedness. It's the fourth in a four-part series, and you can go to our webinar page and see the first three. Uh, but it addresses, you know, tips and tricks from our disaster response program personnel to to help you prepare for and respond to disasters. So please, you know, go to the website and check that out and register for that next webinar because it will have some valuable information as well. Here's our contact information, and you can certainly reach out to me at any time if you need support implementing or deploying GIS to support your operations. And take a moment and and get that contact information if you have any questions for our from our for our presenters, um, you can email them as well. So thank you for attending the webinar and look forward to that email you're going to receive with the resources and the recording. Have a good night. Be safe.